fleet will be sweet. Do not be afraid of sudden terror nor trouble uh, from the wicked when it comes. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. Um, one of the most consistent themes found within the scriptures is, is this idea or this theme of life. I mean, if you think about it in the beginning, uh, life is promise in opposition to death. Remember, if Adam and, and if Adam and Eve would have obeyed, um, they would have been given life. But if they disobeyed, death would come in, both spiritually and physically. And so we see as a result of their sin, we see difficulties, we see adversities that come in life that came from their sin and from those difficulties uh, there, and we see it today, our, our country is being plagued with fears of the different ways that one can die and the way death can come upon us. The other theme that comes across in the Bible is how God brings life. So, you know, it doesn't end there. It's really the beginning of God's story of how he brings redemption. God brings in life, life eternal, through the redemptive work of his son. The Bible talks about the way of life over and over again. You read of the way of life, the bread of life. We think of the water of life. Over and over again, these themes of life. Life is a persistent theme. And it's a persistent theme here in this section, if you pay, if you may note there. So when you read uh, John's writing, for example, go through his gospel, go through his epistle, go through his the book of Revelation and notice the theme of life over and over again. So his writings overflow with images uh, of life referencing the gospel. But as you think about life, in the life that, that is being discussed in the Bible, I think one of the more fascinating uh, pictures or illustration of life is seen in this, this little obscure phrase, the tree of life. And here we see in verse 18, she, referring to wisdom, is a tree of life to those who take hold of her. Now before we get into this section, I mean, you know, a lot of times we think about uh, the Proverbs, sometimes there's not connection from, from idea to idea, but in this, this particular chapter there is. I mean, he just told you in verse 11, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father of the son in whom he delights. But how does this section, you know, and then he goes into happy is the man who finds wisdom. Well, here we saw the, the discipline of the Lord, the chastisement of God. God chastises those he loves according to the text. A wise man is happy when his heavenly father intervenes on his behalf. Because he knows his father loves him, is for his good, and the end result is growing in spiritual knowledge and understanding. So the author of Hebrews in the New Testament picks up this section and reminds us God's chastisement brings the peaceable fruit of righteousness. So many times we have hard you know, difficulties, disharmony, we have adversity, and we despise them. But we forget to stand back and say, our Heavenly Father brings those into our life for a peaceable end. Well, the author follows up this section of the discipline, the chastisement of God, and he says, happy is the man that finds wisdom. Albert Barnes makes this note. This is the beatitude of wisdom. It's important for us to consider what brings us happiness. So before you came in here this morning, if I had to hand you a card, write down the things that bring you happiness. What do you think? If you could get them, if you could attain them, what would you put on that card? What brings you happiness? How would you respond? Would attaining and retaining wisdom even be on the list? When you think of what makes me happy, does attaining wisdom even show up on the list? Well, Solomon says it should be at the top of the list. Notice what he says here. Verse 13. Happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. As we read through, you know, verses 13 through 18, as you read through this, there's no demands. There's no commandments. Rather, Solomon recommends wisdom to us. We should pursue it since there's value to us. If you remember back in Proverbs 2, 1, Solomon pressed, you know, the, the idea that we should earnestly seek wisdom. He assured us that we would succeed in our sincere and constant pursuit of it. We would attain it. We would grasp it. But here's the question. What do we find when we get wisdom? Well, Solomon shows us the profit of gaining wisdom. So in verse 13, we see wisdom is our beatitude. Wisdom brings happiness. Look at verse 18. She's the tree of life to those who take hold of her, and happy are those who retain her. This challenges you where you sit. If, if world, and this is going to challenge you today to think through, am I worldly minded or Christ minded? If you're worldly minded, you're going to sit here and say, I don't know if wisdom really brings happiness. You're going to be challenged all throughout this teaching. But that's the point of this section, is to challenge us. 
Wisdom is happiness to the believer. True wisdom which consists of knowledge and love of God and conformity to his statutes. Solomon says that is going to bring you true happiness. Notice, attaining wealth, power, influence doesn't bring happiness that wisdom brings. And we've got to pause there. Do you believe that? I mean, if you're indoctrinated and influenced by the world, then this sounds utterly ridiculous to you. But this is where you learn to lean not on your own understanding, right? But you need to learn to trust the one who created you. You need to learn to trust the one that knows what's best for you and me. He knows what's going to bring ultimate satisfaction for this life and the life to come. Now, notice there in verse 13 again. Pick it up. Happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. So we have this beatitude literature here. And, and really, let's go back. Even though worldliness has consumed most of the church, if you just stop for a moment and pause, it shouldn't surprise any of us that the Bible says the person who finds wisdom is truly happy. They're content. Wisdom should give cheerfulness to our demeanor. It should bring joy to our soul, no matter what is going on around us. Wisdom gives us a cheerfulness about doing what is right and what is proper rather than just following duty like a chore. Now, many of you kids are probably obedient, especially when your parents are around. You're given a chore, but you do it as a duty rather than to say, this delights my father, this delights my mother, and I'm going to be cheerful doing it. I was a kid once. I know what it's like to do what your mom asks you to do, and you just do it. It's like, if I don't do it, she'll never shut up. That's not doing it with cheerfulness. And what God's Word says is that when we find wisdom, we can do what is right cheerfully even if it costs you. Now, how do you know that you're maturing in the Lord? Well, there's a lot of things I think we can consider. But do you do what is right in the Lord with cheerfulness? And if you do, then you can say, you know what, I'm maturing, right? The Lord is working on me. He's doing a work within me. Let me just say as a pastor, when I have to counsel somebody, uh, assuming they're not turning from the faith, but there's a lot of times I've counseled and the people hear the counsel, and I put the load on them and said, look, if you want to turn this situation around in your life, you do these things. And they walk out and they do them. But they don't walk out with a smile on their face. They're not mature. They're not maturing. The mature Christian says, I need to hear this, and I'm going to do this with cheerfulness. Because it's good. The person who finds wisdom has happiness, he has cheerfulness, and he can be cheerful when he does what's right. Well, Proverbs teaches us, happy is the man who finds wisdom and gains understanding. To understand the Lord and do what he commands makes the believer cheerful. Why? Because it makes your heavenly Father pleased. It pleases him. Our tendency, though, is to look around us. Our tendency is to covet what other people have. To understand what the Lord asks us to do brings cheerfulness to the believer. And when you grasp that principle, then Solomon says... You are more wealthy than the wealthiest of men. You have attained value and wealth that no other man in this world has attained. But if your tendency is to covet other people's things, you know, we think, uh, oh, well, if I could just have that car, if I could have that house, or the, those clothes, whatever it is people covet, right? You fool yourself into thinking you would find happiness. But have you ever read biographies of rich individuals, for example? What is the one common theme that you see in there? No matter how much they have, they never have enough. You see, materialistic things never satisfy, ultimately. But Solomon says, this is something that will satisfy. When you find w wisdom, you will be content. The Bible tells us that we're far better off than the wealthiest individuals when we have wisdom and when we gain understanding. So young people, if you gain understanding... The Bible is telling you and teaching you here, you're further along than the wealthiest of the wealthy in our, on our planet, right? You gain happiness for this life, and you gain happiness for the life to come. And what Solomon's going to tell us here in just a moment is that you have had access to the tree of life. You see, money can't buy those things. If money could buy those things, then just think back, right, of the wealthiest people, our entertainers, our sports stars, um, those who have made a lot of money. What do we read about them? Look at the number of divorces in those families. If wealth could buy happiness, then why is Kanye divorcing that Kardashian chick? Nobody has as much money as Kanye, right? 
that doesn't satisfy. There's no true happiness there between, you know, that that doesn't bring the happiness that they require. We see divorce rates go up within the wealthy. We see drug abuse, alcohol abuse, suicide, uh, the amount they spend on therapists. It doesn't seem to me that it brings happiness. But you didn't need to see their experience to know this. All you had to read is the book of Ecclesiastes to know that it doesn't bring satisfaction. But unfortunately, many in this land go into great debt to achieve the American dream only to find out it's a nightmare. And it did not bring them happiness. Only God can give us insight as to what brings true joy. So God's word is teaching us something here this morning that is in complete opposition to the world. If we gain wisdom, then we're so much better off than the wealthy. Now we need to pause and ask ourselves, do you really trust God and his word on this point? If so, then do you believe verse 14? For her proceeds are better than the profits of silver and her gain than fine gold. Now notice this, do you believe God when it comes to this principle? If you do, then you would give yourselves to gaining wisdom. I would give myself to gaining wisdom. So let's ask you, let's let's put ourselves to another question. What do we give ourselves to? Where do you exert your efforts? When it comes to wisdom, would you say you give at least 1% of your time to pursuing her? 1% of your time would be, out of a 24-hour day, about 14 minutes. Do you even give 14 minutes to going after this vast wealth that God says we should be going after? It's a little convicting, isn't it? I mean, just do, you know, this afternoon, go, go do a little a time, uh, spend a little time accounting for your time and what you do each day. Where do you spend your time? And what you spend your time on is what you're passionate about. Where you spend your time is what you're actually investing in. And if you can't account for any time to giving it to gaining wisdom, then do you believe God's word? Do you trust God's word? Gaining wisdom is far more valuable than all the wealth I can build up according to God. John Gill, in his commentary on this particular section, says this, The believer is a spiritual merchant. Faith is a trading with and for Christ, and for spiritual and heavenly things by him. And because there is a parting with something for Christ, as a man's sinful lust and pleasures, his own righteousness, his friends and relations, when set in opposition to or are in competition with him, and even life itself, when called for, and because he runs a risk of suffering reproach, afflictions, and death itself, therefore this concern with him and enjoyment of him is called merchandise, which is better than that of silver, or that of silver which is got by merchandise. For Christ and the things of Christ are more valuable than silver, and to be preferred unto it, more useful than profitable than silver is, which a man may have a large abundance of and lose his soul, whereas by Christ is the salvation of it, more satisfying than silver is, with which a man is never satisfied, whereas he that has Christ has enough, having all things more pleasant in obtaining and more safe in enjoying, a great deal of anxiety and vexation attend the one, and inexpressible pleasure the other, and more durable and lasting than that. The enjoyment of Christ is forever. You kids ever, you know, thought, if I just get fill in the blank, game station, ear pods, a car, if I could just get these things, I would be happy. Any of you within a day, or maybe even the day of, if you celebrate Christmas and you exchange gifts, you're excited. By the end of the day, are you already asking for something else? Why is that? I mean, if you thought, I, I do, um, because... What you got that you thought was going to bring that satisfaction is so fleeting. Does that make sense? And what the Bible is trying to teach us here is Christ is not like that. As you get him, you want more of him. You attain to him, right? All right. Look at verse 15. It's not just as though you find wealth and gain and the proceeds are better. But notice what verse 15. She's more precious than rubies and all the things you may desire cannot compare with her. That says it all, right? Solomon's making the point. Happiness is not going to be found in any material thing. Also, wealth cannot even buy wisdom because wisdom is in a category all by itself. She is so unique. She's so invaluable. She's so surpassing in value, you can't find anything that you can liken her to. Let me try to give you an example to drive on the point. It may not be a good example, but you could probably come up with a better one. Let's say I gave you the finest cut of well-aged meat Perfectly seasoned, perfectly cooked, 
you cut into it, you eat it. And I said, what is that like? And you look at me and you say, you know, it's like a good can of Spam. I went, what? You can't compare this piece of finely aged, cut, seasoned, cooked meat to Spam? Well, that's what wisdom's like. She's in a category all of her own. You cannot compare wisdom to anything that you desire. That's what Solomon says. Whatever it is you desire, whatever's at the top of the list, Solomon says wisdom's in a whole other category. Nothing can compare to her. Wisdom is better than riches. And he turns around and says, no, 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 no. It's not just that it's better than riches. It's you can't even compare her. What are you going to bring to compare to wisdom? The answer is nothing. Nothing compares to her. You want to know how great wisdom is? You can't even compare anything to it. That's how great wisdom is. Now let's check your spiritual maturity at this point. Is that how you view wisdom? Do you conduct your life in such a way that you really believe this? Do you tell people, I have a fear and reverence of God, but you don't put a priority on gaining wisdom? God is saying, if you fear me, you trust me on this point. Do you demonstrate that you walk in the ways of the Lord and demonstrate his character? I mean, if we say, wouldn't you, wouldn't you agree with me? Let's just put it on me. If I came to you and said, I trust and fear and reverence God, but I put no premium on wisdom, what would you say? You're lying. You don't really believe it. You don't really fear him. Because God says you should put a premium on wisdom. Well, young people, do you think when you get older, I'll invest in wisdom then? Well, then your priorities are messed up. You need to be investing in wisdom now. And parents, when we look at our children, do you look at them and say, gosh, you know, you think about it, I don't really see them putting a priority on wisdom at all. Well, where did they get that from? Where did they learn that? You see, if we put a priority on gaining wisdom, then they'll see, yeah, that's valuable. More than likely, what happens with our children is whatever we're putting a premium on, that's what they're putting a premium on. So we need to make sure we're not passing down a curse to our children by denying this section of Scripture that it even exists. We need to show it. We need to believe it. We need to trust it. We need to live it out in front of them. Look at verse 16. Length of days is in her right hand. In her left hand, riches and honor. Well, I mean, listen, I know maybe this is going to come across wrong, but I think you get the point. Just out of selfish reasons, you should love wisdom and want to attain it. Because after all, don't you want to live? <laughs> length of days is in her. Now, uh, as I've been doing these blogs and stuff, I've listened and read different commentators and listened to different pastors preach on, on these proverbs. And one that really stuck out to me, I, I didn't find this in writing, but the guy who, who said this, I don't have any reason to doubt him, says, it turns out in ancient Egypt, the goddess Maat, the goddess of order and truth, this is, there's a picture of Maat holding in her hand the symbols or objects in both of her hands. And they're the same objects that are depicted here in this proverb. Length of days is in the right hand and riches and honor in the left. And I can't help but to think that what Solomon is doing is he's putting a challenge to the worldview and the wisdom of the Egyptians because he's saying, look, you're not going to find length of days and riches. Uh, and, and the idea of riches there is prosperity. You're not going to find that in these false gods of the Egyptians. You're only going to find it in godly wisdom. Wisdom from God is what truly brings you length of days and prosperity. Look at verse 17. Her ways are the ways of pleasantness, and all of her paths are peace. Well, let's think about this. Wisdom promises long life, prosperity, pleasant, peaceful life. And when you think about it, it sounds like heaven on earth. Now, wisdom is offering you all the benefits of heaven. And if you think about it, this is exactly what Adam would have enjoyed had he obeyed. So what wisdom is doing here for us is it's offering what Adam relinquished. Remember, Adam decided to live his own life. Adam decided to lean on his own understanding. He would make himself his own final authority. He refused to submit to God and do things his way. And when he did this, what did he give up? He gave up length of life. And the day if you eat of the fruit, you will surely die. And he did, emotionally, spiritually, physically. What else did he give up? Well, he gave up prosperity and riches. Because God says in the, in it, you know, the day that you eat of it and the curse that he gave him, he says, by the sweat of your brow, you would toil for everything. Did he give up honor? Yeah. Right? In sin, they hid from God in shame. There's no honor in sin. 
God shows up looking for an account of what they have done. But there's no honor here where Adam and, is blaming Eve and Eve is blaming Adam. And God puts them out of the garden, out of the home that God made for them. Well, what else did Adam give up? He gave up a pleasant life. And that's what sin does. Eden before the fall was ideal in every way. They had a perfect relationship. They got to enjoy the presence of God in their sinless estate. And Adam gave this up. And that's what we give up when we sin. Uh, did he give up peace? Yeah, absolutely. Due to his sin, peace was lost. Hostility has entered the world. I mean, you see in the Genesis account, there's hostility between Adam and Eve. You see now there's enmity and hostility between God. And so there's hostility between creation and the man God placed over it. There's hostility between the created order and creation itself. And it's in this context that wisdom says, I offer those blessings to you. If Adam would have been able to enjoy the tree of life, this is what he would have enjoyed. And so Proverbs comes in here and says, her ways are the ways of pleasantness and all of her paths are peace. And so this next verse, verse 18, summarizes all this by saying, wisdom, she is a tree of life to those who take hold of her and happy are all who retain her. So wisdom now is compared to what? The tree of life. Many times we read about these figures of trees and vines. They use, they're used as figures of speech you know, for life itself. In John 15, Jesus tells us that he is the vine and his people are the branches. Christ gives us life and sustenance. And, and as, as we are united to him. But I mean, just notice how much life is mentioned here in this section. Verse 16, length of days is in her right hand. Look at verse 18. She's the tree of life. Verse 22, notice this. So they will be life to your soul and grace to your neck. Turn to Proverbs 4 and look at verse 13. Take firm hold of instruction. Do not let go. Keep her. Why? For she is your life. Look at verse 22. For they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. Over and over again, we see this idea of life. And, and let me just ask you, do you think life here in this context is just breathing? There's something more here. We'll flesh this out in a moment. But I want you to think about what is he saying? There's life here in wisdom. So how can wisdom be a tree of life when you think about that, right? Well, let's go back. And what I want to do is go to Genesis 2. I want you to see the verses that talk about the tree of life. And let's see if we can put some of this together and figure this out. Genesis 2 and verse 9, we see this. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So God has created the garden as a place um, you know, for Adam to live. And in the midst of that garden was this tree of life. There's also a tree of good and evil, but they're not the same tree. And so if Adam had passed the test not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and take his understanding of good and evil from God himself and not become the authority for himself by eating of this tree, then God would have granted Adam the right to eat of the tree of life. Now the tree of life was not some magical tree that the moment you ate of it and the juices ran down your throat, life was given to you. All right? The tree of life is what we call a sacrament, has a sacramental character to it. It was an outward sign that God by his inward grace gives to us. In other words, if Adam had been confirmed in righteousness and passed his probationary period, then God would have given him eternal life that was symbolized by eating of the tree of life. So what does the tree of life really symbolize? Well, there's an emphasis placed here that the tree is in the midst, in the middle of the garden. What is that telling you? Well, it's telling you that God's not some peripheral thing to Adam. He is central to Adam's world before the fall. And so his life and our lives should be centered upon God. David Thomas in his book on the Proverbs says this tree of life was central. Godliness is in the center of man's nature. God was not per a peripheral thought to Adam. He was to be central. God was to be the center of Adam's life. And our lives should be the same. And we see all around us, there's something wrong. Life is out of source. Something's out of balance. Why? Because God's not central to fallen mankind. There's disharmony. There are many in the churches who do not claim Christ as Lord of every area of their life. And what we need to understand when it comes to the gospel, Jesus didn't just come to earth to save souls so that you go to heaven. He does that, but he does so much more, doesn't he? 
He came so that we might re, he might reorient us to what Adam lost. He came to reorient us to the Lord and make God central to our lives again. We're to live uh, with these redeemed spiritual lives in a way that pleases Him and demonstrates that He is the center of our lives. All of our dealings, whether economic, whether political, whether social, recreation, family life, all should show the glory of our Maker. Everything should be focused on Him. Christ came so that our lives would be God-centered. I mean, I don't know if some of you were here years ago when we did the, the, the training on children. And remember, what was the emphasis of that child training? Do you have a God-centered home or a child-centered home? The child-centered home revolves everything about what the child wants. The God-centered home looks to Christ and says, what does he want for my home? Well, you, you take that application and you apply it to your business, to our church, to just my relationships. In every area, I want God to be centered because this is what Christ has redeemed me back to. Remember, everything the first Adam lost, the second Adam is recovering. And there is something lost as Adam has been thrust out of the garden. He no longer has access to the tree of life. That has been disturbed. That has been, you know, there's, that's been disrupted. So the second Adam brings order by bringing us and reorienting us to this place where God is central and center. Now turn to Genesis 2, 3. This is after the fall. And notice what happens here. Verse 22, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and placed the cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden and the flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. But what's the point here? The point here is that if Adam, after the fall, would have taken the fruit, then there would have never been hope for him. There, there would have been no chance for redemption if Adam had tried through sacrilege to take life in his own terms. God would not have reconciled with Adam if he would have partaken of the tree of life after he had already taken of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And this is why God thrust Adam out of the garden. Adam was alienated from life. And he was only going to receive life on God's terms, not his terms. God blocks the garden to keep Adam from returning in his own strength, in his own wisdom, or his own power to try to take the tree of life. It's a rather sad story, isn't it, when you think about it? But there's a happy ending. Turn over to Revelation, because this is where we see the tree of life mentioned again. Revelation. Go to Revelation 2. Revelation 2, look at verse 7. Now, he's writing to the church of Ephesus. And he ends by saying in verse 7, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, notice this, to him who overcomes. And remember, when, when we've done our study in Revelation, we've emphasized this theme of overcoming. But to him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of, par of the paradise of God. So this is the first promise to the church there in Asia Minor. God is now granting to his people through the redeeming blood of Christ to eat of the tree that Adam was barred from. Adam was prohibited from eating of the tree, but we who are in Christ can partake of that tree. We, through the merits of Christ, can go right into the midst and meet with God. Jesus says, this is what I grant to those who know me, who love me, who serve me, and overcome by my power. Now turn over to Revelation 22. We see the tree mentioned again. Revelation 22, verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the middle of its street, and on either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So the day is coming where God's salvation is going to be manifest so fully that the nations will be healed by, by the very leaves of the tree of life. But these are beautiful pictures, poetic pictures of salvation. One of the themes in Revelation is that God will save a people out of every tribe, tongue, and nation. In other words, he's bringing healing to the nations. David Thomas wrote, this is the tree, this tree of life is restorative. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Godliness restores waning faculties and decaying powers. Look at verse 14. Blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. 
You know, those who have been washed by the blood of the Lamb. Blessed are those who submit to God's authority by doing what He commands, which demonstrates a submission to His Lordship. And in so doing, they have the right, they have the authority, they've been authorized to go to the tree of life. Man was once banished from the garden. He was banished from getting to the tree of life. Man was you know, uh, uh, prevented. But on this great eschatological day, at the consummation of history, God for His people will restore that right for the people of Christ. He will allow us in righteousness, in the righteousness of Christ, to partake of that thing that Adam relinquished. Do you see the pictures, the bookends of the scriptures? It's introduced there in the beginning. It's introduced there at the end. But what about the middle? Well, in the middle of the story, we have Proverbs. And we read the tree of life. Wisdom is the tree of life. Turn back to Proverbs 3. Proverbs 3. What was lost in the beginning, what will be given, given at the end of the age, can be enjoyed in some measure by those who walk with God and apply his wisdom. I'm going to drive this point home a little bit more later on. When I say walk with God, if you only know God by principles, in other words, if you only walk by a list of principles and commands, you're missing out. But when you walk with God, then those principles become a tree of life. Does that make sense? I'll drive it home a little bit more, but keep that in mind. All right, so what was lost in the beginning, we can in some measure enjoy now. Wisdom is a tree of life to those who lay a hold of her. This is why Solomon says, happy, content, blessed are all those who find her. Those who lay a hold of wisdom make God the focal point of their lives. That God becomes the center of their lives again. If you're walking in godly wisdom, by definition, God's the central point in your life. Well, look at the beauty of wisdom, the power of wisdom. The Lord, verse 19, by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the depths were broken up and clouds dropped down the dew. Here we see the beauty and power of wisdom. Now, how does this fit in with what we've just read, right? Notice the connection. First, we see the tree of life, which takes us back to the creation account. And since wisdom is being recommended, Solomon is showing us the true character of wisdom. To desire wisdom is to be in alignment with God's will and in alignment with his character. And when we walk in wisdom, it's showing a respect of God's character. To be wise is to be godlike. Wisdom has its own beauty. It has its own wonder. Wisdom is much older than this world because in wisdom, God created the earth. And so we see wisdom in God's creative works here in creation. Solomon looks at the intricacies. He looks at the beauty of creation. And he says, that's the wisdom of God. Now here's, here's what gets me. Think of the foolishness of man who rejects the wisdom of the one who can just speak all of this into existence. Right? But we as his children should desire to take the wisdom he gives to us. He, and, and as he gives to us wisdom, we should apply it. We should embrace it, and we should desire to retain it. Do you see how dense the unbeliever is when they look at the manifestation of God's wisdom everywhere they turn, but yet they reject God's wisdom? Just think of the intricacy of the eye. How is it that you see me and I see you? There are reactions that are taking place in your eye that happens in picoseconds. Do you know how fast a millisecond is? Well, the picosecond is a lot faster than that. In order for you to see me without some huge delay, these reactions have to take place incredibly fast. Do we just think that happened by chance? The unbeliever does. But the believer says, wow, that's the wisdom of God. That's the manifestation of the wisdom of God. And we as believers, the one who spoke that eye into existence, Solomon is saying, you better trust him. Walk in wisdom. Walk in wisdom. Here's another one. Think about water. We just kind of take water for granted. And, and I was all, as a chemical engineer when I was going through school, and one of the first th molecules we learned about was water, H2O. Y'all know that, right? You got one oxygen molecule, molecule, you got two hydrogen. Well, what makes water liquid? Most molecules stay in a gaseous form for the most part. What makes water liquid? Well, it's this thing called hydrogen bonding. So the hydrogens on the water, the H part of it, will have a bond, and they coalesce together, forming liquid. That's how we have it here. Now, what's interesting is as you put energy into it and it evaporates, those hydrogen bonds break apart. Now you have these loose molecules. They evaporate. They coalesce up in the colder air and then distill back to the earth. 
Well, let's look at verse 20. By knowledge, the depths were broken up and the clouds dropped down the dew. What is Solomon talking about? He's talking about the cycle, how you actually get water to drink, how water out in the ocean gets onto the land so that the land just doesn't parch up. You think that happens by accident? God created that. That's the wisdom of God. Or could just consider how the, the relationship between plants and animals. Have you thought about that? Through photosynthesis, what takes place? You got a little sunlight, you got CO2 in the atmosphere, you know, water in the ground, there's some nutrients there in the plant through photosynthesis. The plants absorb CO2 and give off oxygen. And then we as animals take that oxygen on and convert it to CO2. Chance? No. The creation was spoken into existence. This creation was, was brought about through the wisdom of God. This is the wisdom of God. The more we study out his world, the more we should have this sense of wonderment in God's wisdom. And this is exactly what Solomon is teaching us here. If you ever look at the wonder of the world, you see wisdom of God, and this is exactly what you should want. So as a pastor, and as you mature in your walk and your faith, as you study out creation, and you start bringing things to bear with God's word, and then you have someone come to you who is in clear violation of the principles of God, who refuses to submit their life to the wisdom of God, but yet they think they know more. Could you have come up with the water cycle? Could you have come up with the reactions to make the eye work? Could you have come up with this system where plants and animals together survive and live? We've only talked about three things. The more you study in science, young people, the more you're going to see the wonder of God's creation. That should encourage you to say, wow. I know as a little kid, some of you might have gone you know, to some one of these theme parks and you're like, wow, look at the wonder of all these things. As the older I got, there's less and less wonderment there. I think, <laughs> wow, what did I ever see in this thing? That's not how it is with God. The more we press, the more we study and know about God, the more, wow, the more sense of awe and wonderment we have. Look at verse 21. My son, let them not depart from your eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion so there will be life to your soul and a grace to your neck. Then you will walk safely in your way and your foot will not stumble. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. Yes, you will lie down and your sleep will be sweet. Do not be afraid of sudden terror nor of trouble from the wicked when it comes for the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. Well, in this sin-cursed world, there's so many dangers out there. But, uh, you know, those who come under wisdom, those who lay a hold and grab a hold of wisdom come down under the benefit of God's protection. And so they walk with a sense of confidence and boldness. And so Solomon says, give diligence. Give diligent atten attention to wisdom and discretion. Look at verse 21. My son, let them not depart from you. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. Wisdom and discre discretion do not come spontaneously, right? Nor does it stick easily with us. Wisdom and discretion, discretion are not going to you know, just come by lying around. It's not like you're just sitting there and all of a sudden, oh, now I'm wise. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. Wisdom doesn't overcome you like that. Wisdom takes forethought, planning, seeking after God and His Word, prayer, surrounding yourself with other wise people. There's nothing worse. Here's the thing. A companion of fools combined does not lead to wisdom. A companion of fools just leads to foolishness. In fact, I don't think it's an additive thing it's like you add several fools together and now you add up to wisdom collectively. I think what you have is a um, power effect. So it's like if you have two fools, it's fool square. If you have three fools, it's fools cubed. Right? And on and on you go. You need to be careful who you surround yourself with. And so we want wisdom. We desire wisdom and discretion. So we're going to have some forethought. We're going to plan. We're going to surround ourselves by wise people who apply God's word. And so as he reveals principles and truths to you, then you apply them. Wisdom takes prayer and receive, being able to receive correction. Uh, wisdom, you have to have the ability to break destructive habits. And as you gain wisdom, be careful that wisdom doesn't leave you. You see, it's not like you arrive at wisdom and then you coast. I mean, it's unfortunate that we're reading about some very wise, very brilliant men who something took place in their life where they achieved a level of wisdom and understanding of God's Word. And I don't know what happened in their lives, morally speaking, but then the next thing you know, they fell and they fell hard. 
So my point here, you know, we look at those and just kind of think, golly, what happened there? No, when we see those examples, we need to say, how does that not happen to me? When we see the fall of some brilliant men, if we see the fall of wise men, we need to realize that somewhere they let their guard down. They got to a place where they thought, oh, I've arrived. No, when you attain uh, wisdom, you've got to retain it. Okay? Make sure it doesn't leave you. You see, it's not like you arrive to wisdom and you coast. No, anything in life worth keeping requires constant attention. Think of a good marriage, right? A good marriage requires a lot of attention, thoughtfulness, commitment, sacrifice. And when you lose those things, the marriage runs into trouble. Or think about children. They require constant attention. It's not like you can say, oh, my children have arrived. I can just stop. No, as long as they're there in our homes, we've we got to give them the, the, the attention they need. And that, I think that's a real problem in reform circles, right? Where there's this fatalistic attitude. Well, you know, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. I mean, I can't influence the outcome anyway. I'm just going to let go and let God. Well, that's a problem because the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that God not only decrees the end, but the means to the end. He's given us instructions, and our duty is to apply those principles diligently. So, to have a good marriage, to be able to raise godly children, takes work and attention. And the same is true when it comes to wisdom. And by the way, just so we know, wisdom will only strengthen your marriage. Wisdom will only strengthen your abilities to raise and train your children. But if wisdom is to be attained and retained, then we must give it attention and we must work towards it. And so here's what it, notice this, if you get wisdom and if you retain it, notice the blessing. Verse 22, there will be life to your soul. Once again, this idea of life. Be life to your soul and grace to your neck. The, the Hebrew construct here of life is this, this fulfilled life, this blessed life, the favor of God in your life. That's the picture here, right? In other words, when you apply wisdom, you, don't, you won't come to the end of your life with regrets. But the life, the life in the book of Proverbs is far more than just mere existence, right? So, so let's consider some examples. When I think of Joni Erickson Tyler, right? Uh, when I think about her in, 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 as a quadriplegic, do I say that her life is not fulfilled because she's a quadriplegic? No. There's a sense of honoring God even in her adversity. She is living a full life in this sense of the word. Life is more than just breathing. Okay? Let's flesh this out a little bit more. You really want to experience life in the way that God intended? I mean, think back to whenever you've experienced disharmony. You've had disharmony with your friends, your family, your business you know, associates, in the church. You can rest assured living in the sense of this word is not taking place when there's that disharmony. That disharmony comes from an absence of the application of wisdom. Now, it could be the lack of wisdom on my part. It could be the lack of application on their part or a combination of the two. But there's an absence of wisdom that's bringing in that disharmony. And when that happens, you're not experiencing life in the sense that's being used in this text. Turn over to Proverbs 15. Let's look at a few examples. It comes up over and over again in Proverbs, this idea of life and, and the association with wisdom. Notice what he says in Proverbs 15:20. He who is greedy for gain troubles his own house, but he who hates bribes will live. Notice how life is the opposite of a troubled house. In this Proverbs, we really see living is the opposite of this uh, death-like disharmony. Life brings vitality to the whole being, whether psychological or physical. Hold that thought here and turn over to Proverbs 14. Um, look at verse 30. A sound heart is life to the body, but envy is a rottenness to the bones. So whenever you experience disharmony, start looking for the root of of where the principles of wickedness are being broken down, right? You need to be able to break down that situation. In these two last Proverbs, we've, we've read about envy, we've read about greed. Those are certainly uh, characteristics that are going to bring in disharmony, right? But you, it could be bitterness, it could be anger, it could be rebellion, dishonor, which happens in a lot of homes, idolatry. It could be all these things that are causing the disharmony. But if you want to regain a sense of life, then you have to be able to break down the situation and understand the root cause of disharmony so that you can bring wisdom to bear to that situation. Turn to Proverbs 10. Proverbs 10, verse 16. The labor of the righteous leads to life, but the wages of the wicked to sin. Now notice that. 
Life is put in contrast with sin here. Notice life, true living, living that has benefit in this life and the life to come, is sound in righteousness. The fruit of the wicked is sin. Now you might think, the writer might say, the fruit of wickedness is death, but remember, the wages of sin is death. Turn over to Proverbs 21. Proverbs 21. Look at verse uh, 21. He who follows righteousness and mercy finds life, righteousness, and honor. So notice here, who finds life? Those who put into practice things such as righteousness, things such as kindness. Those who cannot control their anger uh, and, and have these frequent outbursts of wrath are those who are controlled by their passions and lust or anger. I mean, you know, when they don't get their way or, or someone gets easily frustrated. They're not experiencing the kind of life being described here in Proverbs and more than likely their lives are miserable. There's no peace. There's no harmony within their homes. There's disharmony there. And all the while, they can't figure out where the disharmony is coming from. I mean, have you ever met an angry person? And they can't ever figure out where the disharmony is coming from. And they can see the anger in someone else, but they can't see it in themselves. Well, you could pick harmony. You could pick bitterness. You could pick envy, greed, all those vices that the Bible says that we as Christians should work and ask God to purge out of us, right? Just remember, when you see disharmony, disunion, and you're not experiencing the kind of life, the, the favor that God gives to His people, start breaking down, start using wisdom and ask yourself, where is the root of this coming from? But these few texts, the concept of life kind of being described, points to godliness and harmony. The kind of life that's being promoted here has a wholeness to it that can only be described as the favor of the Lord in every aspect of your being. So are we enjoying that? Are we enjoying that? Are we experiencing that today? You know, Go back to these texts and start asking yourself, where is wisdom being neglected in my life? Because that may be where the disharmony is coming from. What is God trying to teach me during these times? Well, we go to him and say, Father, you've got my attention. Show me the source of my disharmony. Where is it coming from? May I root this bitterness out of my life. May I root this greed or this covetousness, whatever it is, this envy, whatever's going on in my life, help me to root it out of my life so that I might experience the life that you're talking about here. Let's get back to the favor of God. Go back to Proverbs 8. Let's talk about the favor of the Lord. Proverbs 8. Proverbs 8, verse 35. For whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. Talking about wisdom again. When we are right with God, we have a sense of satisfaction. Just think about what this verse is saying. The wisdom that comes from God teaches us to avoid evil and pursuing after righteousness. When we apply these things, the text is saying, you find life. You find the favor of God. Turn to Proverbs 19. Proverbs 19. Proverbs 19, verse 23. The fear of the Lord leads to life. And he who has it will abide in satisfaction and he will not be visited with evil. Life is, is you know, bright and full. It's a full concept in Proverbs. It's, like I said, it's, can you, let me back up. Are you beginning to see life is more than just breathing here, right? He's talking about something greater. We're talking about the favor of God. And I hope we get the point. Those who find wisdom find that kind of life. Those who find wisdom find the favor of God. And, and it includes all the covenantal blessings that Moses talks about over in Deuteronomy. Let's look at it real quick. Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28. In verse 1 it says, Now it shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God and observe carefully all of his commandments which I command you today that the Lord your God will set you high above the nations of the earth and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God now notice the favor of God blessed shall you be in the city and blessed shall you be in the country blessed shall you be the fruit of your body and the produce of your ground and the increase of your herds and the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your block, of your flocks blessed shall be the basket and the kneading bowl blessed shall be when you come in and blessed when you go out the Lord will cause your enemies to rise against you and be defeated before your face. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you. The Lord will command the blessing on you in your storehouse and in all which you set your hand. And he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God has given you. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself. 
just as he has sworn to you, if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways, then all the peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. And the Lord will grant you plenty of goods and the fruit of your body and the increase of your livestock and the produce of your, of your ground in the land of which the Lord swore your fathers to give you. The Lord will open to you his good treasure in the heavens to give rain to your land in its seasons and to bless all the work of your hand. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You shall be above only and not beneath. If you heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day and are careful to observe them, you shall not turn aside from any of the words which I command you this day to the right or to the left to go after other gods to serve them. Notice, when we talk about walking in wisdom, wisdom is the skillful use of God's law, the skillful use of God's word. We apply his word, his commandments. Then we're going to experience the favor of God. We're going to experience the blessings of God, these covenantal blessings. And it's in that sense you have fullness of life. Does that make sense? So go back to Proverbs 3. Proverbs 3. Look at verse 23. Then you will walk safely in your way, and your foot will not stumble. Notice here, wisdom brings security, brings peace. Um, you know, God keeps you. I mean, like I said, uh, think about the you know in the spiritual warfare. We've been been talking about how we have a vicious enemy who desires to see us destroyed. What kept you from stumbling this week? You know, like I said, we've sinned and we've confessed our sins. We've gone before God and sought forgiveness. But what kept you from stumbling and falling all the way? It's your God. Those who walk in wisdom, those who follow after him, are upheld by him. He'll keep you from stumbling. That's why I love that benediction in Jude. He'll keep you from stumbling, present you faultless, blameless before his Father. That's a great promise. Look at verse 24. Let me ask you this. Any of you appreciate sleep? Go two nights without it. Sleep will become very sweet to you, won't it? Look at what he says here in verse 24. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. And when you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Look at that. Well, you know the sweetness of sleep? I mean, of all the other benefits of wisdom, this one ought to resonate with us. At least it does with me. If you struggle to go to sleep, then go back and find the root cause of your sleeplessness. What is causing this? If you're ill, physically ill, that's one thing, but if, if there's you know, guilt, guilt of sin to keep you up at night, right? Um, if there's something in disharmony that's keeping you up, then you need to go back and find the root cause of those sleepless nights. But God's Word teaches us that wisdom allows us to lie down in comfort and experience the sweetness of sleep, even though there's turmoil all around us. Look at verse 25. Do not be afraid of sudden terror nor of trouble when the wicked, when it comes. Those who walk in wisdom are not overcome with fear. Those who walk in wisdom are not paralyzed to do what is right when it's required. I mean, I think of, uh, I mean, you've probably got more examples than I do, but as you, as you think through the scriptures, can you think of examples of those who walked in wisdom but did not fear even huge resistance, huge challenges? I mean, I think of Joshua and Caleb when they go up and see the land. The other ten spies, they didn't see the opportunity and blessing of God sitting right there in front of them. All they saw were giants and you know things that were going against them. But fear didn't overcome these two men. Wisdom dictated that they must trust the promise of God and overcome the obstacles in front of them. Uh, they were ready to take the land. Consider David. Consider the Apostle Paul. Consider John the Baptist. Consider the Reformers. You know, think, I always think about the Reformers. They put so much at stake just so that they could worship God. And there was nations coming after them. I mean, there were nations chasing them down just to keep them from worshiping God. But those who walk in wisdom are not overcome with fear when it comes to fighting the battles that God gives to them. They walk without fear despite the enemies of God and what the enemies of God are doing to them. Well, here's a great blessing as we get ready to sum this up in verse 26. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. This is a great promise that brings the foundation of our confidence that we have. Jehovah himself is our confidence. The almighty maker of heaven and earth. The one who controls all. The one who sent his son to conquer death on your behalf. He's your confidence. Do you trust that? Do you trust this God? Has fear in any area gripped you to the point where you're just not trusting Jehovah? 
has fear to do the right things in your life, even if it's going to cost you something, cause you to abandon confidence in God so that you do not do the right thing. It happens in business all the time. To do the right thing may cost you on the bottom line. But do you trust God enough to do the right thing? I mean, that's just one example. Go, go to Psalm 91. Over and over again, we see these examples given to us to trust God, knowing that He's our, our refuge, knowing He's the one that protects us. It shows up so many times, it just makes me think there's something to this. I need to pay attention. Psalm 91 verse 1 says this, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers and under the wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night nor of the arrow that flies by day. In this psalm, isn't it beautiful? Jehovah personally is our protection and our refuge. Over and over again, let me give you another one. Go to Psalm 121. Psalm 121. I will lift up my eyes to the hill. From whence does my help come? He, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. The book of Proverbs says that wisdom is a tree of life and that we uh, need to know that is what is behind that wisdom, the commandments, the instructions for living. But what's behind that wisdom is a confidence that Jehovah himself will protect us and keep us and uphold us. We believe in a personal and a mighty Jehovah that protects those who walk in wisdom. He's not abstract. He's a person. This, this is a really a comforting section when you think about it. And we need to hear this in our day because fear has gripped those that we know. First, we need to avoid the fear that is strangled you know, has a stranglehold on, on, on everyone, right? Fear that causes Christians to not press the claims of truth. Fears that keep Christians from even gathering to worship. We need to avoid that. We need to remove ourselves out from under fear and rest in the confidence that Jehovah is our refuge. Once we grasp this, then, then I think we'll be ready to help others from falling victim to fear. We can come alongside those in our land who put their confidence in something other than Jehovah and, and, and as they put their confidence, whatever they're putting their confidence in, it is crumbling right now in front of them. And as their idols crumble, we have an opportunity to show them the rock, the anchor. We have the ability to show them Jehovah. We need to be able to respond with the hope and wisdom that is personified in Christ Jesus. We need to be able to come alongside this fallen race of Adam and show them how they can have access to the tree of life through the blood of Christ. The blessing of the favor of God, the life of God, the fulfilled life that's being described here does not arise just because you have some guiding principles in your life. You understand that? No. Life comes because you walk with God. And because you walk in, in, with God, then you're managing your life by His principles. So I want to make sure we're clear on this. If ever those principles that we've talked about in God's Word are separated from God Himself, they don't become a way of life, they become a way of condemnation. Does that make sense? If ever we take the principles of God and try to apply them separate from walking with God, they don't become a way of life. Isn't that exactly what Jesus was telling the Pharisees? Did they give charitable givings? Did they pray? They did all kinds of good works, but they were separated from walking with God. And it brought condemnation in their life. Jehovah must be our confidence, not in some impersonal, through impersonal principles of life. The tree of life cannot be reduced to a formula. If you're struggling with this concept, think about any other relationship that you have. If I have a relationship with my spouse, my children, my friends, if it were based upon a formula, it wouldn't work. If you try that, it's not going to be strengthened. In fact, it's going to bring resentment. Now, the Bible teaches us that the tree of life is God's center. It draws us to make God the focal point of our lives. I want you to pause for a moment and just think about what I'm saying here. Is God just some impersonal set of principles to you or do you have a relationship with Him? There's a big difference. 
do you know him? Think about, I mean, here's the thing. I want you to think about, I'm going to give you some things, and, and we can talk about this at lunch and probably expand it even further. Just think about some of the impacts of what it means to know God. And as we go through these impacts, ask, does this describe you? Number one, when you come to know God, your mind is humbled. When you get to know God, um, not just some figment of your imagination, right? But when you get to know the God of the Scriptures, it must, by definition, humble your mind. Has that happened? Has your mind been humbled by God? And when I say humbled by God, you're not taking worldly philosophies and worldly views and you know, taking ideas from your unbelieving <laughs> friends or unbelieving relatives and implying them and putting them above the Word of God. What I'm saying is you take God at His Word. And if He says wisdom is in a category of itself, wisdom brings happiness, then you humble your mind and say, I'm going to take Him at His Word. All right, that's one impact. Number two, if you know God, it's going to improve your mind in the way you think. When we pursue and come to know God, you're going to begin to think a little more clearly. You're going to know how to respond in difficult ethical situations. Your mind's not going to be overwhelmed, but rather you're going to be able to think clearly in difficult, challenging days. Does that happen? Or does, when the adversity hits, does your mind just completely go into chaos mode or shutdown mode? As we know God, as we gain our knowledge of God and know Him personally, when those trials come through, we're not paralyzed with what to do. Our mind thinks clearly. And you can go through every example in the Scripture of godly men and women who knew exactly what to do when the hardships came. Why? Because they knew God. They didn't just have a set of principles they lived by. They knew God Himself. Number three, it expands your mind. As you get to know God, you're going to have more time to think about, about, about Him. And as you study Him, your mind's going to expand. In other words, as you study God, you're not going to have less things to think about when it comes to knowing God. You're going to have more. I've been studying it for over 20 years now. I, I, haven't, I haven't ever come to the place where I thought, there ain't really a whole lot more to learn here. No, every time I'm confronted with his word, I'm like, wow. I, you know, I don't know how I read through this in the past and didn't pick up this principle. I, didn't know, I don't know how I missed these things, how they connect together. God is even more incredible than I thought. Next, as you get to know God, it's going to console your mind. When you go through difficult times, you're not going to despair or wring your hands. Rather, your mind is going to be consoled by knowing the God who brought that into your life. Next, it's going to sanctify your mind. As you come to know God, filthy thoughts, unpure thoughts, unholy thoughts, begin to dwindle because God is controlling your mind. He sanctifies your mind. Next, knowing God will grant you great energy for God. People who are not able to live strong, consecrated Christian lives, a lot of times it just, you can trace it back to not knowing God. You say, but yeah, but what about physical ailments? Well, okay, I can, I can point you to all kinds of people in the past. John Calvin, for example. If you don't study out his life too closely, you might miss this man who, who just did all kinds of things had all kinds of physical ailments. I think of Joni Exentana, I'll go back and use her as an example, has her infirmities prevented her from being used by God. We just heard a great teaching last week about Bunyan who sat in prison for 12 years and all he had to do was stop preaching and he could have been out three months. Did he let that situation keep him from being used by God? Not at all. Those who know God are used by God in a mighty way. They have great energy for God. I think about Paul as he sits there in prison he doesn't see that as an opportunity to not be used by God. We have great letters that we can glean from and use in our own lives because he broke and used his energy in prison. Next, it will give you wisdom and direction from God. Your life will not be long run in circles, but knowing God is going to provide you direction, give you focus. Next, it's going to give you great boldness before God and man. Many times professing Christians lack boldness when it comes to testifying about God. But those that know God, Let's back up. Those who struggle with being bold for God may only know Him through principles, but don't know Him at all. And so when we get to know Him, it brings great boldness to testify about Him. It gives us great boldness not only before men to testify before, you know, testify of God before, it also gives us great boldness before God Himself because we have confidence that no man can lay anything against me because Christ has died for me. My confidence is that Christ stands with me. He pleads for me. He gives me His Spirit. There's a confidence that nothing can separate me from the love of God. 
because of what God has done for me. Do you know in such a way that you have great boldness before men and God? When we come to know God, we also have great contentment in God. So here's the question. Are you content in God? No matter what life throws at you, have you learned to be content in Him? If everyone abandoned you, if everyone just stopped treating you the way you thought you should be treated, or people just started being mean to you, right? Are you content in God? What if six billion people on this planet stood against you? Would you still be content in God? When we get to know God, as we get to know Him, we are content. Next, think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who stood in, in the face of persecution, but their response is incredible. They, they knew God and were content uh, with the outcome of being thrown in the fire furnace. They seemed to be content with their situation at that time. I think of Paul in prison. He's writing these letters to encourage the church to have joy while he's sitting there in prison. How could he have such contentment? How do you explain that? He knew God. Do you see the difference now between knowing God and knowing a set of principles? Finally, knowing God gives you great zeal for God. As you know Him, His person, His character, what He has done through His Son, if that caused you to be less zealous, then there's something wrong. As you get to know Him, it should create a greater sense of zeal for Him. There's a personal change that comes about for those who know God. My plea for us today is this. Just don't know Him through principles. Know Him. Know Him. So as you think about life, as you think through the Bible, the Bible has many illusions and illustrations to life, doesn't it? I think, I hope... Maybe I've I've pushed you in in a way uh, to see my way of thinking on it. The greatest picture and illusion that we see here is this tree of life. One of the most beautiful pictures of life is this tree of life that starts at the beginning and and awaits for us at the end. But Solomon says, you can get a taste of that now. When you find wisdom, wisdom is the tree of life. Because you can enjoy the benefits of the tree of life today as you submit to Jehovah through the blood of Christ. And as Christ has not only saved your soul for eternity, Christ also reorients us to go back and make God central to every area of our life. And in that sense, as we walk in godliness, as we walk in godly wisdom, God becomes the central point. And we have the very promise of God given to us here. Let me, I, I, I started with it, let me end with it. Happy is the man who finds wisdom. So let me ask you again. Where are you going to find happiness? God's Word says you're going to find it right here as you lay a hold of wisdom. Father, you are the God of wisdom, and in wisdom you spoke everything into existence. And Father, we just ask that uh, we would be a people who fear and reverence you and take this Word and apply it. Uh, Father, give us a heart that desires wisdom to pursue after it, to apply it in every area of our lives. Father, I pray that we have tasted and seen that you are good, We pray that we have found our contentment in you and you alone. And Father, help us. Uh, We are so prone to come up with ideas that are such odd with your word. But may we not know you as just a set of principles, but may we know you as the living God, the God who sent his son to save us from the tyranny of sin, the power of sin. But you have saved us to righteousness and holiness. You have given us this this, uh, word so that we might walk in wisdom. Father, help us to apply it. May we stand out by your power. In our, in our community as we apply your word and, and give ourselves to it. So, Father, give us hearts of wisdom. Give us hearts to desire your wisdom to apply it within our lives. And it's in the, son, uh, the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.